Good morning. It's good to see people that have been gone for a while back, some just to visit, some back from summer vacations and other places, but it's really wonderful to see all of you again. Earlier this summer, a friend sent me a short video clip of the end of a sermon by David Asherick. Many of you know who David Asherick, he does a lot of sermons on Hope Channel and 3ABN and different places. He's a highly sought after speaker. She had found it encouraging and I was also encouraged by it as I listened to it. It was only about four minute clip of the end of one of his sermons. And as I listened to it several times, I felt that others might benefit from it as well. So it became the seed for this sermon. Let's just bow once more. Heavenly Father, we all are in need of you. And so Father, now I pray that you will guide. May the meditations of my heart and the words that I speak be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. How often do you get discouraged in your Christian walk because you are trying to overcome some habit or resist some temptation and you keep failing and falling? I know for me it happens all too frequently. You know, you think, I really need to get over doing this or I need to stop doing this or I need to change this and you try and flump you go down and you try and try and try and flump you go down again sometimes I feel like Paul when he writes in Romans chapter 7 Romans chapter 7 verses 15 18 19 and 24 for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And verse 18 and 19, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And then he says, and we could say woman as well as man, in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I want to do what's right. I want to be honest, kind, loving, and good, and do that what's pleasing to God. But too often I find myself doing the opposite. It sometimes becomes frustrating and discouraging when we're trying to change a habit or overcome something or resist things. 
Please turn with me to our scripture reading, Proverbs 24, 16. For a righteous man may fall seven times. That's a lot of times. Seven times. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. It doesn't say they fall twice or three times. The righteous man falls seven times, but the wicked fall, period. So at first it sounds like the righteous man is worse off than the wicked because they're continually falling. They're falling seven times and seven times seven. But the wicked only once. But let's look more closely at the verse and think about it. Both fall, but the righteous man gets up again. I brought their stick. When David Asherick did the sermon, he himself laid down on the podium, but I can't do that and get up that easily. I'm not as young and agile as he is. So this is my person. You're walking along as a Christian and you fall. You get back up and you keep walking and you fall again. What's the difference with the wicked person? They're walking and they fall. They don't get up again. If you've fallen, where are you? You're down on the ground or the floor. But the righteous man gets up again. If you stay lying down, can this stick fall again right now? No, it can't. It can't fall again unless it gets up and keeps going. If it stays down there, it can't fall again. If you get back up, as it says the righteous man does, there is a possibility of falling again. But when he falls, the righteous man keeps getting up. That, my friends, is the secret to success in the Christian walk. Get up and keep walking. Even though you fall again, get up and keep walking. Let's look at two Bible characters who I believe illustrate Proverbs 24, 16. There are people that I'm sure most of you know very well. Peter and Judas Iscariot, both disciples of Jesus. Both spent time following him for many years, all the years he was here on earth. But how very different their endings were. Let's begin with Judas. He was the disciple who some people thought would have seemed the most promising of all the twelve. Most of the others were fishermen or tax collectors that really weren't appreciated. They were considered the lowest because they had colluded with the Romans. But he was sort of an upstanding person in, in the eyes of the Jewish people. He was the treasurer, the one who handled the money for the group. He was highly regarded by the other disciples and had a strong influence on them. Judas went out with the others when they were sent out to preach. When they went out two by two, he went along with them. But there was one thing different with Judas. His heart was not changed by the association with Jesus and listening to his words. Let's look, take a look at an incident in Judas's life. John 12, verses 1 to 6. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. This is near, actually, the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Then six days before the Passover, or before his death, I should say. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, 
where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha, Lazarus' sister, served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. He was sitting beside Jesus. Then Mary, Lazarus' other sister, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. And in the margin in my Bible, it says it was worth a year's wages. So it was very expensive. Imagine like today if you went out and bought a bottle of perfume that cost, you know, $70,000. Or for some people, maybe $200,000. Or even 30000 It's a lot of money to pay for a bottle of something. But Mary had spent a whole year's wages. And she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Judas was the treasure for the disciples, and from that little, their little store, he had secretly drawn for his own use. He would just stick his hand in the bag and take out whenever he thought he needed something. Didn't matter whether the other, others needed something as well. He just took care of his own needs. He was eager to put into the bag all that he could obtain, so there would be more for him to take. The treasure in the bag was often drawn upon to relieve the poor, and when something that Judas did not think essential was bought, he would say, Why is this waste? Why was not the cost of this put into the bag that I carry for the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Desire of Ages, page 559. The next glimpse we're going to take of Judas is in Matthew 26, verse 14 to 16. Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. The history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupted enough to do such a deed as this. So in other words, when Judas was walking and he was tempted to steal or to be selfish and want something, and the Holy Spirit maybe convicted him a bit, he didn't listen. He just let that selfishness grow in his heart. He never got up and repented and tried to change. The love of mammon, or money, overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself over to Satan to be driven to any lengths, including betraying the one that he had been following for more than three years. Desire of Ages, page 716. Again in Matthew 26, verses 20 to 25. Jesus tried to warn him. Jesus knew what was going on in Judas' heart, and he tried to warn him and give him opportunities. Matthew 26, verse 20. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, 
Assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. Here Jesus gives Judas an opportunity to confess and change the course he has chosen. But he does, does not give in to the convicting of the Spirit on his heart. And we see how he carries out his plan in verse 47 to 50. Matthew 26, 47 to 50. And while he, that's Jesus, was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Even though he's betraying Jesus, Jesus still called him friend. But Judas' heart just wasn't ready to submit to anything. Jesus goes through the mockery of trials, first to two high priests, then Pilate and Herod, and then back to Pilate. Judas watches all of this going on, and when he sees Jesus is going to allow himself to be killed, he chooses his own ending. In Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5, we read, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. Judas was sorry for the consequences of what he had done, but he wasn't really truly sorry for what he had, that he had done it. He didn't change. He was trying to force Jesus to make himself king. He had a different agenda. And when that agenda didn't work, then yes, he was sorry. But he wasn't really sorry that he had tried. Judas fell by calamity, just like Proverbs says, the wicked will. Now let's look at Peter. He wasn't perfect by any means. Often speaking before thinking, he has been given the nickname Impetuous Peter. He was always sort of leaping before he looked and speaking before he thought. He was the one who walked on water and then when he started to sink, cried, Lord, save me! And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. We can see some of Peter's nature in Matthew 16, 21 to 23. Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes 
and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter is rebuked by Jesus. That must have felt like a fall. I remember my mother telling me when I was younger, she said, I never had to spank you off, and I just had to give you a good lecture, and that did a better job than a spanking. I don't like being rebuked, and I don't think any of you do either. None of us like to be rebuked. So for Peter to be rebuked by Jesus, that must have felt like falling down. But Peter keeps getting up. And we next see him on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he didn't stay down when he was rebuked. He got up and kept walking with Jesus, and he was taken to the Mount of Transfiguration, just Peter and James and John, to that glorious experience where they saw Jesus glorified and surrounded by Moses and Elijah and heard God's voice speak. Next, let's look at Mark 14, 27 to 31. Mark 14, 27 to 31. Jesus warns Peter, just like he warned Judas. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Peter was so sure of himself. He didn't think of the verse in Proverbs 16, 18, where Solomon says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now let's look at Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus asked the disciples to pray. But they all slept, including Peter. Then when the multitude with clubs and swords led by Judas came to arrest Jesus, Peter again thinks it's time to take action. Without thinking, in John 18, verses 10 and 11, we read what Peter did. John 18, verses 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Peter is again rebuked. And Jesus heals the ear back on. Turn with me to Luke 22, verses 54 to 62. Luke 22. fifty four to sixty two. Having arrested him, that's Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, 
Another saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. Peter truly had meant it when he said, I won't deny you. But the pressure on him was just so much that he did things he didn't even realize he would do or that he didn't want to do. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter and Peter understood himself. That look of Christ's broke his heart. He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance. And like the publican, he went out and wept and prayed and found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. Now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. Christ's Object Lessons, page 152 and 154. Peter had fallen big, but he realized his mistake and he got up again with God's help. And he kept walking and it made, he, his life was changed after that experience. He had a hard fall, but is back up, and we see him running to the tomb with John. After Jesus is resurrected, and Mary Magdalene is, runs to the, comes to the tomb Sunday morning and finds it empty, she goes and tells the disciples, and Peter and John run to the tomb. John beats him because he's younger and quicker, but Peter is the first one to go inside and see that the tomb is empty. Then, in John 21, we see them at the seashore. Peter is given a charge by Jesus to feed his lambs and sheep. Three times Jesus asks him, do you love me? And each time Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. There's no pride anymore. There's just humbleness and sorrow that he denied his Lord. And so Jesus gives him the instruction to feed his lambs and sheep. And three times Peter acknowledges his love and willingness to work and suffer for Jesus. And as we read in Acts, we see that he followed through because in Acts 2, when he preaches at Pentecost, thousands are converted. In Acts 5 and 12, he is put in prison for his preaching and sharing the gospel. And twice, on two different occasions, he is rescued by an angel. But even with all these victories, you know, Peter is now walking strongly, but he's still prone to fall. Turn with me to Galatians 2, verses 11 to 14. I'm using a different Bible today than I usually do, and it's taking me a little longer to find the verses, sorry. Galatians 2, 11 to 14. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, this is Paul writing now, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I, this is Paul speaking, 
saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? When Paul spoke so harshly to him, Peter realized that he had made a mistake. He had fallen again. And he did everything in his power to correct the wrong impression he had given. God allowed this humiliation to help him remain humble. Peter again has to get back up. And he does. In his epistle, 2 Peter Verses 1, 1 to 4, we read. Second Peter 1, 1 to 4. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Peter is no longer taking any claim for anything himself. He's saying it's God, his divine power, who has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What made the difference between Peter and Judas? It was confession and repentance. Peter was truly repentant and kept getting back up when he fell. Judas did not. So what does it take to get back up after falling? It takes sincere repentance and confession. It takes looking to the cross seeing Jesus who died for me and realizing that what I have done has caused pain to him. Something I don't want to be doing over and over again. But sorrow for sin and wanting to repent doesn't even come from my own sinful nature. Matthew 9 verses 10 to 13, we are told how we are drawn to repentance. Matthew 9, verses 10 to 13. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the, ta at the table in the house that behold many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus is calling us to repentance. And in Romans 2.4 it says, The goodness of God leads you to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly or true real sorrow for something I've done produces a repentance that leads to asking for forgiveness and reconciliation. I seek God's help to change. The sorrow of the world is being sorry for the consequences, but not sorry for the actions or the words. It doesn't produce a desire for forgiveness, reconciliation, or change. They just want to get away from the consequences when they say they're sorry. God has promised forgiveness to those who ask. One of my favorite verses is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 1.18, we read, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And in Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7, we are encouraged. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And in Ephesians 1, 7, Paul says, In him, that's in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So as I ask for forgiveness, as God brings repentance to my heart, and I answer and I respond to that call, I ask for forgiveness and seek God's help to change. He is working in my life, and positive things happen. I gradually fall less often. You walk and you fall. You get up, you ask forgiveness, and ask God's help to God. You walk, and maybe next time you walk a little further before you fall. And as God helps you change and brings those changes in your life, you keep walking further and further between falls because God is working in you and through you for his glory. It's a process called sanctification. It is nothing I can do on my own but only God working in me. Romans 3, 10 and 23, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I can't do anything on my own, but it's God working in me that does it. Romans 6, 15 says, We are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 2, verse 16 to 18, we read, For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he, talking about Jesus, does give aid to the seed of Abraham, and that's each one of us. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Christ alone had experienced in all the sorrows and temptations that befall human beings. Never another of woman born was so fiercely beset by temptation. Never another bore so heavy a burden of the world's sin and pain. Never was there another whose sympathies were so broad or so tender, a sharer in all the experiences of humanity. He could feel not only for, but with, every burdened and tempted and struggling one. Education, page 78. He understands when we fall. He's been tempted, but he did not fall, and so he's able to help us get up and keep going. In Titus 3, verses 1 to 7, Titus is a little book just not far from Hebrews. Just two books back from Hebrews. Titus 3, verses 1 to 7, Paul says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. 
For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Sounds like lots of falling. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In Ministry of Healing, page 65, it says, Do you feel that because you are a sinner, you cannot hope to receive blessing from God? Remember that Christ came into the world to save sinners. We have nothing to recommend us to God. The plea that we may urge now and ever is our utter helpless condition which makes his redeeming power a necessity. Renouncing all self-dependence, we may look to the cross of Calvary and say, In my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I claim. Again our scripture reading, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Peter and Judas both fell, but one kept getting up again, even though he fell over and over. At the end of his two books, Peter writes, 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And then in Second Peter 3, verses 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. I thank God today that even though I fall many times, if I get up and keep going, I will be able to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he has promised to help me and to be established, strengthened, and settled. I want to, along with Peter, give God the glory both now and forever. And I pray that is also your desire. Let's keep getting up. Keep pressing on to higher ground. Our closing song is Higher Ground, page 625.